Good evening. Thank you for coming out this evening. We're going to begin by singing 392. Has a war theme to it, as does the history we're going to go over this evening. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, my might, my constant helper in the fight. Of course, the fight of which David speaks, though it has a physical aspect, is even more a spiritual battle between right and wrong, good and evil. The stanzas one, three, uh, sorry, one, four, and five. One, four, and five of 392. Thank you, Lindy. I will read two brief passages from the Old Testament. The first is in Exodus 13, and it's verses 17 and 18. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. Of course, the Israelites had war in the wilderness on occasion. Uh, but God has a purpose in causing his people to avoid war or the sight of war. And at the same time, he would teach them war. And so Judges 3, the first two verses, actually the first four verses, now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. Only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. Namely, five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal Hermon unto the entering of Hamath. They were to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses." Both of those passages imply the need for war, a certain kind of war, among the covenant people of God, and we too are reminded of the need to battle spiritually. I'll uh, explain how that relates more to the theme in a moment, but let's open with prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, our prayer is that thou wilt go with us again this evening, instructing us in right and in truth as regards the history of our churches, and then enabling us the better to see thy guiding hand and thy wisdom in all of this history, as well as to praise thee 
for all of thy attributes that are displayed in all of history, thy wisdom and mercy and truth and grace, thy forbearance and long suffering, thy justice as well as thy grace. And our prayer is that we might the more understand that we've been led by thee and that the heritage we have has been given us of thee. Not only as regards the doctrines, though they are very important, but also as regards our understanding of Scripture and our freedom in Christ to live according to thy word and the history of our churches, all is from thee as a gift. And so may tonight's lesson also be uh, have this effect that we have a greater appreciation for our history. Father, give us to understand, on the one hand, the awfulness of war when it's raged and waged among the heathen and among nations, but also the importance of war when it's the manifesting of the antithesis between thy people and ungodliness. Graciously forgive our sins. Keep us from sin. Bless our denomination in all her causes, in all her congregations, her office bearers, and hear us for Christ's sake. Amen. So last week the theme was the PRC in the Depression years. I see that I, on the first page, have not changed the top title, the top line, so that I have the PRCA in the Depression years again. But it's the PRCA in the war years tonight. Last week I thought I could do more integrating the theme, not just that, well, that's what was going on in the country, but showing the effects of the PRC. And I... I, I couldn't do as much as I had wanted. Maybe uh, with more research I could do more. But tonight, very prominent, the idea of war. It's not just the PRC in the war years. It's how the war, uh, World War II especially, affects the PRC. That thought will come out strongly. And then my third point, if you look at the outline, my third point is going to transition to the PRC's spiritual battles during these years. And especially uh, the, the goal was to show that uh, 1953 and all that leads to it is already beginning. In fact, I am not going to be able to get to point three tonight. And so we'll begin with that next week. And next week we'll conclude the classes with a look not only at the spiritual battles, the, the ways in which you can see that 1953 is on the horizons, but also a more detailed look at some of the issues that the classes East and classes West faced in the 40s. So the PRC in the war years, two, three things, three things of a side note to begin. In the first place, uh, the Protestant Reformed Seminary, unique among most seminaries in that it has 100% support from the denomination. And therefore, we don't have to have somebody going around raising funds for the seminary. Part of the support is a new addition, two years old now, I think, and that includes a new archives room. And uh, this isn't just trivia. I'm going to tie it into the lesson in a moment. Um, a, a desk where Bob Drenick works one day a week as he uh, processes the archives. The movable storage racks that are enabling us to put in one, well, in the room we have probably four times as much as we could have without these racks. And the point is that Mr. Terpstra would love any memorabilia that you might have that is not like right now, go home and give it to us if you're not ready to part with it. But before you move to, South, uh, to Sunset Manor or before you downsize, Please, old bulletins, church directories, church newsletters, photos. They can include family photos too. It doesn't need to have a specific denominational connection. It's that you were a member of the denomination. But any memorabilia relating to the PRC um, and family resources that relate, please give them to the seminary. The archives room has, I think, 10 of these and two full ones, I think two are full, 
with some others full of uh, unrelated material. But we've got plenty of room, and we want to expand our archives. So that's a plea from Mr. T. In the second place, uh, as I've given the lectures, I have made some historical or factual errors. I am aware, uh, and maybe I said this already, that back in lecture three, I said World War II had just ended, but it was World War I that had just ended in the 1920s. Uh, Creston PRC I showed last week as being in a building on Plainfield. In fact, it was on Leonard. And I may have made some others. Do let me know uh, because I plan to correct my mistakes and uh, remember them, the, the truth for the future. So even historians uh, do misspeak. And then side note number three. If I spend, I'd say, two days a week getting ready for every class, Mr. Terpstra is spending probably another full day at least, and that's what a historian calls a research assistant. I want to acknowledge his work and thank him uh, because much of what you're going to see tonight, especially the pictures, are a matter of him finding the pictures. I'm saying, look for this kind of picture, and he goes and does the grunt work, and I want to show my appreciation to him for that. The war years, World War II especially, World War II lasted 1939 to 1945. Uh, the U.S. tried to stay out of it for a while, but couldn't very long. Uh, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in 1941, December, we entered the war, especially on the Pacific front. And then we also supported and were involved in the war in Europe a little later in the 40s. As far as America goes, uh, you have effects like the draft, and that's going to significantly affect the PRC. You have a wartime economy, factories are changed into those that will produce food for the war effort or military vehicles, airplanes, other equipment, warships. Really, it was the war that ended not the Great Depression per se, but the effects of the Great Depression. The Great Depression, as far as historians are concerned, was finished in the 30s, but unemployment continued. And the war had this economic effect that it put an end to unemployment. Even FDR's initiatives could not get unemployment under 10%, but the war helps do that. But of course, at the same time, taxes increase. Rations go up. There are victory gardens. They'd mean, almost be meaningless to me. Uh, but a, a garden in which you would plant uh, food, I'd say they'd almost be meaningless to me, but I always, uh, as a kid, remember uh, that between us and the neighbor was a very large garden, and the neighbor worked that very large garden. Today, a house is sitting where that very large garden was. That was a victory garden. So there are effects in America, and one of them also is that the women go off to work. Anyone know Probably some of you do. What's the name of this woman? Rosie the Riveter. Off to work. All right. So there are effects in America, and we're going to uh, talk about the effects on the PRC. First of all, though, the PRC during the war years, just general history, uh, and I'll begin with growth and losses. Four churches are organized. I said last week that Mon Manhattan came just in the 40s. In fact, it came just in the 30s. And so I'll throw that one in here because I didn't have it in last week's. Uh, Manhattan, Montana, you can read Reverend Hanko's Less Than the Least for his memoirs of serving here and get a glimpse of what at least a beautiful scenery, what a beautiful country it must have been. In the Depression years, he said they always had milk. And that was quite something for his wife especially and for the health of people. So a church in Manhattan that left in 1953. Randolph in 1943, uh, a result of mission work. Manhattan was also. Fourth Grand Rapids, a result of First Church having a daughter. And Hamilton, Ontario, a result of mission work to the Dutch immigrants. So four churches uh, begin or are organized in 1943. I have a picture of Randolph. As last week I said that Edgerton was one of my favorites, so without shame I say also Randolph was. 
The first picture here was the Christian Reformed Church that they bought um, soon after organizing. Uh, it was the Basement Church, very famously known Basement Church. The CRC's plan had always been to build the second level, the, the auditorium above it, uh, but they never did. Randolph, PRC, when they bought it, thought someday we'll build an auditorium above it, but they never did. So you entered this structure and you went downstairs into the basement and sat and worshipped with rafters right over your head. And I'm quite sure it was Prof. Hanko or so who said, if you were a man of his height, you had to stand still. You couldn't pace like you used to because your head was between the rafters. All right, and then the building they built in 73, and this is that building that they built in 73 yet, which is now the narthex and uh, bathrooms and the nursery, and the new sanctuary is there. Uh, put on while I was the pastor there, an exciting time of life to see a church growing and needing an addition of that nature. Fourth, which becomes southeast, uh, earlier buildings, and this is the most recent one that they have now sold and vacated, um, but various buildings that they worshipped in. So there were 21 churches, now there are 25, except that Byron Center disbands in 1944, so that puts it to 24. And one other congregational note is the bankruptcy of Roosevelt Park. I think I referred to it earlier uh, a man owned the church building, a member of the church owned the church building, and rented it to the church, and then decided, especially in the Depression era, the, uh, the time when money was not uh, overly abundant, that if he sold it to the church, he, could, he wouldn't have to pay the taxes. And so he sold it to the church on a land contract, which meant the church is making payments to him, and the church is unable to make payments to him. According to one source I read, it's a, 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 personal, a person's personal recollections. This man was also one of the uh, best contributors to the uh, collection, to the building fund, and he started contributing less. And the church is unable to make his payments, so he takes the church to court because they aren't able to make their payments. And the Circuit Court of Kent County finds in favor of the church, but the Supreme Court, to which the man appealed, finds in favor of the man. And at that point, the church declares bankruptcy because it is not able to make its payments. Uh, that, that, there's a little more than just Roosevelt Park church history here. I want it to bear on the PRC. First of all, that's one reason why Roosevelt Park takes the name second. The congregation's history continues, and it continues essentially, but it must reorganize legally and take a different name. It becomes Second PRC, with Second, of course, referring to the Second Grand Rapids PRC. But also tying in with denominational church history, the Synodical Committee, uh, we don't have one anymore, or if we do, it would be the Board of Trustees, but it was a different a bit of a different mandate at the time, the Synodical Committee recognized that uh, Roosevelt Park is filing for bankruptcy and that Roosevelt Park owes the PRC uh, for assessments that it has not paid and that bankruptcy would have uh, really end up meaning that it wouldn't end up paying those. So the Synodical Committee joins the list of creditors to whom money is owed and Synod, 1940, when it hears that, says, no, we do tell churches, pay your assessments. And when you haven't paid them, we remind you what you owe, but we are not going to sue or join in suing one of our own congregations. So um, that's how that relates to PRC church history. As far as seminary graduates, there are, I think, nine graduates, in addition to the nine graduates uh, Lambert Duzema, who had graduated in 39, is ordained in 40, but the first graduate is candidate John Heiss. He's the first graduate. He's the first one, uh, first graduate of the 40s. He's the first one examined by a synod, because as we'll see in a moment, uh, 1940 was the year in which there was a synod. And he is the first graduate uh, regarding whom classes or synod said, you, we will postpone your candidacy for a time, for a year, 
so that you can study postgraduate work. Uh, I don't know what his reasons were. They don't really ultimately matter either. Synod asked him orally. They, they wanted him to come. He wrote a letter saying, if you declare me a candidate uh, and, and I pass my exams, could you delay my eligibility for a call for a year? And they called him and he, oral, he, he appeared uh, in body before the Synod and gave his reasons, which they accepted. Uh, what they are, we don't know. But in 1941, he's declared a candidate. So that's Heiss. In 1943, and again, the color coding uh, relates to where men are. John Heiss is in black. He stays Protestant formed his whole life. Sebastian Kaminga and Walter Hoffman uh, graduate in 43 and leave with the DeWolf group in 53. John Piersma graduates in 43 and soon and is declared a candidate and almost immediately goes off to uh, the Christian Reformed Church and ends up graduating from Kelvin Theological Seminary four years later in 47 and serves ministry in the CRC right from the start. James Van Wielden uh, died within the last two years for sure. I remember seeing his obituary notice in the uh, banner. James Howersile, who also goes and Edward Knott, who goes to the CRC. Uh, Edward Knott, one of the men who left in the DeWolf group, who I believe was vocal, even as the DeWolf group in the late, uh, early 60s, late 50s, is considering disbanding and returning to the CRC. Edward Knott, one who says, that's entirely against what we've stood for all along. So he did go back, but had... Um, a, a few more convictions at least was going to let them be known. Uh, Hoxima, I'll have to come to in just a moment, Gerald Vandenberg also graduated in 47, became a Protestant Reform minister, and in the early 60s left the PRC, uh, probably facing discipline, uh, deposition, suspension deposition, if he didn't, and uh, yet has some uh, descendants in the PRC to this day. Back to Hooksma moment, and we'll tie this in when we get to the seminary history also. Uh, he graduates in 47, but is the second man who is not eligible for a call, uh, but studies postgraduate studies in the seminary. They, they established a postgrad course for him, and I'll come back to why. So it's in 1949 that he uh, takes his first pastorate. So we have men, and uh, I have a class uh, picture of the 47 class. Um, we have men, we're growing in families, we're growing in churches, we're growing in ministers. The growth in the 40s was not as great at, at great a pace as in the 30s as regards churches and as regards ministers. But if you look, and I have it on uh, page two of the handout, if you look at the family statistics, um, the PRC by the end of the 40s is numbering 5,575 total members, uh, 1,339 families, so the growth is certainly steady. All right, let's look at some of the denominational concerns during these years. First of all, the first Senate is held in 1940. And a picture, uh, what the picture doesn't have here, although in the archives it does, is a list of the delegates. And Synod, held in 1940, uh, understands the need to bring the church order of the PRC together, uh, not only translate it, but also make um, the decisions pertaining to it and, and show how we're going to take the church order that it was essentially Dort's church order and make it pertinent to the PRC. So that work goes on, and in the 47, a, a church order of the PRC is published. Now I refer to it being published, but it has been in existence already. Uh, it's just being developed and, and published in its book of form in 47. The official language becomes English. It said last week that in the 1930s, the PRC was very much Dutch. It's true that the first English-speaking PRC was formed in 1929 already, that there are English-speaking people and English-speaking services 
but it's predominantly Dutch, and things change in the 40s. A synod and both classes East and West make English their official language. And as we'll see in a moment, uh, the songbook, the English songbook, the Psalter as we have it, becomes more widely used. They translate committee constitutions, the church order, etc. All of these that were in Dutch, the, the, the synod notes are being translated into English. So there's a concern to uh, make the people more English. Now, you can ask why. And one answer is going to be the simple, by 1940, our people are becoming more Americanized. But you also can say that in 1940, the war had started. And the Dutch language and the German language are miles apart in the mind of a Dutchman, but only millimeters apart in the mind of an Englishman. So it's very much uh, in the interest of the denomination to start making these changes. As regards missions, it is a it is a interesting year or decade rather as, as regards missions. We saw last time that Reverend Cock had been the missionary, and uh, through his work, Edgerton has been established. Manhattan, Montana now has been established, and he goes to labor in Zealand. I think it was the 1941 Acts of Synod. It's a very interesting report um, from him about his work in the Zealand area. Uh, 1942 to 47, we have no home missionary. Cock takes a call in 1941, early 1942. From 42 to 43 then, the mission work that's done is done by ministers in local churches who go out and do work in the vicinity near them. And so at C. Hanko, he's in Oaklawn, Illinois, and so the closest to Randolph, Wisconsin, who does mission work in Randolph, assisted by other men, and under the auspices of the mission committee, Randolph is organized. 1946, the question is, are we ready for foreign missions? The churches recognized they would need someday to do foreign mission work, and uh, a field is suggested in China. And the churches, in response to that, say, we need to be thinking of foreign mission work, but we're not up to China at this point. And so the answer to that one is no. But there's... Uh, a readiness and an eagerness to investigate other foreign fields that the PRC at that age would be more able to work. In 1947, two men accept a call. The, the churches have decided in the 40s that when doing mission work, we need to send two men out, even for home missions. And so two men, Reverends Edward Knott and W. Hoffman, accept the call. Edward Knott actually is a candidate. He graduates seven and goes right into uh, the mission work. And Synod and the mission committee has faced the question a few years earlier whether that may happen, and they said that's permissible. So he gets the call. The two men together labor in five areas. In Byron Center, now Byron Center disbanded in 44. So in 47 already, it's one of their first fields of labor, recognizing two things. There are conservative Christian Reformed people in Byron Center, and there are PRs who live in Byron Center who are traveling long distance to churches. Still, it's a bit surprising that within three years of the disbanding of a congregation, we would send missionaries to labor in that area. They go into northern Michigan. I'm not sure exactly which cities. They go into Iowa. Also, there are not sure exactly where, although I don't think it was as far northwest. I think it was more central, but I could stand corrected on that. They go to Linden. It'll be 53, 52 or 3, before Linden's organized. And Harbach will go there as, um, let me back off and not run down there too quickly because I'm, uh, I'm not sure I've got all my effects in order. But they labor in Linden, and then they labor in Ontario, where Dutch immigrants are coming uh, in the late 40s after the war is over, especially in the Hamilton-Chatham area. They recognize the need for a Dutch-speaking missionary. 
And in, in some stuff that has to wait till next week, uh, in a protest of uh, Reverend uh, Opoff regarding the, the mission work, I'll just give you this. There, he's protesting that first decides, first is the calling church choice, decides to send not to Linden and Hoffman to Ontario. And among other things, uh, Alpoff says, we decided that the two had to labor together. He has more substantial issues also. One being Hoffman doesn't know the Dutch language. How are you going to send an English-speaking missionary to labor among Dutch immigrants? So in 1949, uh, Reverend A. Kaminga is called to be a missionary. He does speak Dutch, and he will go labor there in uh, Ontario. The point is the churches are active in the work of missions, and they are, in 1940, 15, 16 years old to 25 years old. So maturing, yes, not, however, um, very old. And so we recognize early on the need to do the work of missions. It's an active year that way. It's also an active, I keep saying year, but I mean decade as regards contact with other churches. First of all, there's the Christian Reformed Church. Now, I have in your handout a number of pages, 10 or more, I think, uh, from the Acts of 1940 Synod. On pages 3 and 4, I have the first 15 articles. And the point of those simply is to say this is historic. Here is the opening of the first of our synods. But on page 5, article 76 and an address to the Synod of the Christian Reformed Church is read in its final form. And on pages 5, 6, and 7, that's found. The point is that the, the, CRC, the, the PRC recognizes the need still to call the CRC uh, to see its error and to turn from its error. And so on page 5, about halfway down the page, let's see, you have your Roman... Your, um, your Roman number one, and then four points of Arabic. The Synod of the Protestant Reformed Churches admonish and begs you herewith to rescind these doctrinal declarations. And I won't read the grounds on which it does so. But that's thing number one. Number two on page six, under Roman numeral two, uh, we also beg and admonish you in the name of Christ, the King of His Church, that you repent of the acts of injustice upon which your Synod of Inglewood, Chicago, 1926, set its seal of approval. And that refers to the deposing of faithful office bearers from their offices and putting the churches outside of the CRC. Now, Roman numeral three at the bottom of page six. We are constrained. We, what's, our, what's our purpose of doing this? We're not trying to embarrass or humiliate you. We're not self-seeking. We're constrained by the love of Christ and they point out that the blessing of the Lord cannot rest on your churches as long as you maintain the erroneous three points. I'm not going to finish reading um, the whole thing, but the point is there is a lengthy letter to be written to the Christian Reformed Church. It does get sent to the Christian Reformed Church, and there is a year later no response uh, in 1941 from the CRC. And so another letter to the CRC and the CRC's response in 1942, which is essentially uh, very brief, um, were not interested. Still, the churches understand the need still to admonish the CRC for uh, its errors. There is contact now with the protesting CRC of Kalamazoo, the Danhoff group. In the 30s, a church, Roosevelt Park, had had such correspondence, and the PRC Class has said, we are not responsible for it. Now the Synod does send a letter to them. And the value of this letter, I've got it included on pages 8, 9, and 10 of the handout, uh, and into 11. I'm not going to read any of it. The value of it is that it gives an extensive summary of the history of the Danhoff case in 1925-26. And so... It has historical value in two respects. Summary of what uh, the Danhoff issues were, and then secondly of the PRC saying to Danhoff, we're willing to talk. And while the PRC said, we think 
all these are errors you committed, they said, we're, if you think we're overlooking something we did, we are open to you uh, pointing that out. Again, the fruit of that is that there is not uh, any further uh, discussion between the two, and so the matter rests. But the PRC has done what it could to address the CRC and the protesting CRC of Kalamazoo regarding past history. Interestingly, uh, in a little while I'll come to ref not just the Reformed Witness Hour, but another radio program called the Sovereign Grace Hour. And a minister of the Reformed Church of the United States, that would be the German Reformed, hears this Sovereign Grace Hour broadcast and gets in touch with the PRC ministers, and this leads to some correspondence and contact with the RCUS. Now, the RCUS at this time uh, is becoming very liberal. In fact, they're about to have a merger. I don't remember. It was in the 40s. I don't remember exactly which year. A merger of all, almost all the German-based churches. So the Reformed Germans, the Lutherans, and others are going to merge into what's called the Evangelical and Reformed Churches. And there are ministers, especially in South Dakota, Nebraska, etc., part of what's called now the Eureka classes, who are very concerned about this. So it's one of these ministers, at the time the denomination is going to make a, a major change, that they are interested in having discussions with the PRC. And so there are conferences with RCUS men, uh, representatives of both churches attend the others, synods, etc., RCUS men come to study in the PRC seminary and such. Uh, one of the results of this is a Reverend Mensch. Uh, he's one of the men who studies in our seminary, and there are Mensch's descendants of his yet in the PRC. Um, Mrs. Miedema, is it D? I don't remember. From, okay. Uh, uh, Amy Mole is a mensch. So there are there there's blood that comes into the PRC, uh, and then there is at the same time going to be, especially in the 50s, some uh, bad blood, some bad feelings between the RCUS and the PRC uh, over Reverend Mensch's encouraging the churches of Isabel and Forbes to come into the PRC. But there is uh, contact with the RCUS. And then there is, this is not formal and official now, but less official, attempts to keep in touch with the Reformed churches in the Netherlands. Uh, they write to Dr. Skilder. A Skilder is in hiding, and then I think for a time, maybe have been even prison, but he's in hiding in the early 40s during the time of um, the war. But they try to keep in touch with him and others there to find out the, the status of Reformed believers. There's an effort to take collections for the relief of the, the war, uh, those affected by the war in the Netherlands. All of this is going on, which demonstrates then that the PRC, when it was able, made efforts to keep in contact with other believers throughout the world and even in the United States. None of these pan out into any sort of official relationship, uh, but efforts are made. We'll come to the seminary. Now, in the upcoming issue of the journal, the Lord willing, that would be the fall issue, and the fall issue probably won't come out in print form until next winter or spring. Um, paper supply issues are one of a number of reasons why the print issues come out so late now. But I'm going to have my next installment, the Lord willing, of the history of the seminary in the 40s and 50s. So what I'm going to say here, I'll just hit some of the highlights, and you can read uh, in a six months or so more of uh, what goes on in the 40s. Well, you have the war in 1944, and that affects the seminary in a couple of ways. Number one, the, the seminary uh, visitors, a, a committee that visits the classes say, at no time in the history of our seminary have we had so few students. Why? Well, one thing, men are being drafted. But in addition to men being drafted, um, 
the seminary pre-enrolls any man who's interested. He might say, I, I want to go to the seminary. I'm not able yet. I've got to go to college first. But if the seminary were to pre-enroll him, the man is exempt from the draft. So that happens. In other words, still the Lord says there will be men who will be PR ministers, and they won't all go in the draft. Uh, they will be able to get government exemptions. Also, in the years 44 and 45, the seminary must meet during the summer months. And that's a government stipulation. If you have students who are exempt from the draft because they're going to your school, they are going to go to your school year-round. And so it meets in the summer months. And the TSC emphasizes what goes on in the summer is not just going to be some fluff. We have to fulfill a requirement. These boys are going to get taught uh, as, uh, as diligently as they would have been taught during the uh, fall and spring semester. So that's going on in the 40s. In 47, uh, for a while before 47, there's a recognition of a need for a pre-seminary course. Now, some college-level courses have been taught at the seminary, especially Latin, Dutch, uh, Greek at a seminary level. But the need to expand that has been recognized in with a view to a pre-sem course down the road, let's start a post-sem course, a postgraduate course, to train a man to teach the pre-sem and college-level courses. That's what happens down in 1947. A man is called, Synod officially calls a man, to take the post-grad courses with a view to teaching in the seminary, and the man they call, one of the graduates of 1947, Ed Knott, goes right into missions. The other candidate, H.C. Hooksema, is called to take these courses. That doesn't make everybody entirely happy, and there's going to be a little more history about that in a moment, but he does. He, be, he plans to take post-grad courses under Reverend Hooksema, his father, and Apoff. They're going to create special courses for him, and local area ministers can also. One week after HCH is called to do this, his father has a stroke and is unable to teach in the seminary for the full uh, year. So what happens is that as part of his preparing to teach pre courses, Homer teaches pre sem courses. And uh, there's only one student, and that is Herman Mensch. So he teaches him and does some other uh, work on the side to train himself to be uh, a professor. Now, 1949 comes around when Synod says, all right, it's time to call this man. So they have a number of men on the slate. Um, it's sort of assumed that probably Hooksema will get the call because, after all, he's been called to prepare for it. But in the end, he doesn't get the call. I'm not up to that one yet. Um, though he's on the slate, he's on the aggregate, uh, Reverend Lambert Duzema gets the first call, and Reverend Peter De Boer is appointed to get the call if Duzema declines. And both of these men decline the call. Therefore, because uh, Homer doesn't get the call, he is declared eligible and he enters the ministry in 1949 in Dune. And at the end of the year, we trained a man to be a prof. We called two other men to be a prof. None of them are prof. We only have two profs. With a view to 1953, something that couldn't be foreseen in 49, probably the Lord's uh, hand was guiding us in a wise and in a good way. But the point is, it's very eventful years. And um, again, there's some tension. This might even factor into 53. Uh, why is the Hoxima man the one being promoted for prof? Um, there's also a question, as Adams and Hope are getting started, and as Free Christian School Society is getting started in Edgerton, 
and Redlands has already been in existence. So we've got four PR school societies now. There's a question whether the seminary can help train teachers. So a normal training course would be a school or a course that helps prepare people to teach. And the TSC is getting letters left and right from individuals and from school organizations saying, help us teach people to be teachers. Now, there's some interest in that and sympathy for that on the part of the TSC and the profs. But in the end, uh, the decision is, you know what? We have two profs, and they are ministers, ordained ministers, and we've called them to teach men to be ministers, and they're spread thin as it is, so no, we really can't help you with your school training. So uh, that too. Now, another thing in the 1940s that you can't escape is the matter of the Psalter. The Psalter, of course, uh, made in 1912 by the United Presbyterian Churches, uh, especially Covenanter, Scottish Covenanter churches in the United States. And it is the English songbook of the Christian Reformed Church. So if you ask, how does the PRC get the Psalter? The answer really is by default. I looked and could not find any official decision that the Psalter should be the PRC songbook. That isn't to suggest it's not officially ours. It is by default. If you're an English-speaking church using an English songbook, it's the Psalter. There just isn't another one to consider. However, in the 30s, most PRCs are not using the Psalter because they are singing Dutch. And so the Dutch psalm books are predominant yet in the 30s. Classes up through 1939, whenever its minutes record the singing of a song, it is we sang Psalm 105, verse whatever. And that tells you they're using the Dutch psalm book. It's in 1940, for the first time, that you see Synod using the Psalter. I'm not saying the Psalter was first used in 1940. I'm saying it was not denominationally wide used until the 40s because so many sung Dutch. So, in the 40s, so soon as the Psalter becomes the English songbook that more and more is going to be used, a committee is appointed to investigate, number one, the printing. The CRC is finished using the Psalter. In 1934, it adopted its first Psalter hymnal. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on in the United Presbyterian Churches anymore. But it's the Dutch Reform now who are interested in the Psalter. And so they need to figure out how can we get this printed. We don't have the copyright. Uh, Erdmans has the copyright. And he's willing, he says, to let the Reformed Churches, PRC, later the NRC will be in on it as well, use the Psalter. And possibly revise. What I'm arguing, and it's far from being the main point I want to make tonight, what I'm arguing is that so soon as the PRC said, we are singing in English, we are all singing in English, they said, and what can we do to make this book better? So the scope of revision in 1940s, as you all know, there was no uh, final outcome. For 15 years, the PRC worked on Psalter revision, but the, uh, the covenant, uh, conditional covenant controversy uh, zapped the ability to uh, spend time on it, and in 1955, Senate officially said, we're, we're just not in a position to do any more here. But what work was done? You read the Acts of Senate 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49. What's going on? Well, the lyrics of the Psaltery Committee is working to purge the Psalter of doctrinal errors. If you understand that the United Presbyterians I said Scottish Covenanters, do have a doctrine of a well-meant offer, then even though you and I, and we will say proffer is not inherently wrong, and those Psalters that speak of our choosing uh, can be explained in a theologically correct sense, and, and I believe they can, yet what did the United Presbyterians mean by them? 
you can read them very well in light of their uh, idea of a well-met offer being taught. So there are doctrinal errors. And then are the versifications faithful to Scripture? And those are questions we're looking at now as well in our Psalter revision. As far as the music goes, we have just gone from the Dutch Psalms to an English Psalter. Can we bring the Dutch Psalms into the English Psalter? And so the chorale section, uh, 414 and on, is added in the 40s. In that sense, there is Psalter revision. Uh, the Psalter, uh, 1912 Psalter, does not have Dutch Psalms in it. The Scotch didn't feel the need for that. The Lord's Prayer, 433 and 434 are added. And that much actually happens. And then there's looking into tune changes, which does not happen. What does happen, if you ever find a 1927 Psalter, what does happen between the 27s and the end of the 40s is key changes are made. There are a number, I think, someone here could tell me if I'm wrong. Are there a number of songs with four sharps in the 27th Psalter? She says yes. So we don't have songs with four sharps in our Psalter today. There are key changes. And just one verse appears between the music with all other stanzas uh, underneath And so there are formatting changes that come out of it. Um, There's a liturgical section in the back of the Psalter that they're looking at uh, making changes to. And then uh, the committee comes to Synod, I think in 47, saying, what if we added versifications of scriptures that deal with the birth and the death, the resurrection and the ascension of Christ and Pentecost, And in fact, the committee says, we've started this work. And at that point, Senate says, you don't need to continue that part. Thank you very much. This is going on in the 40s. All right. What I, oh, what I tried to do is look at what's going on as a denomination. How about church life? Well, there are magazines. The SB is being published, and I did not have time to page through all the SBs in those decades now, but uh, Alpoff is continuing his Old Testament history. Uh, H.H. is writing on the triple knowledge. We'll see later that volumes of triple knowledge are being published already in the 40s, but he he works through it serially in the Standard Bear. The Church News magazine that I showed last week uh, continues through 1943, and then it stops. The Beacon Lights start in 1941, and they go to the present, and the Concordia starts in 1944. You have in your handout the first editorial of the Beacon Lights, pages 12 and 13, um, in which just one comment on page 12, really the first paragraph of the editorial. Uh, Reverend Hanko, C. Hanko, gives a few snapshots of the beginning of the Protestant Reform Young People's Federation. Not 18 months ago, the Federation was organized in South Holland, Illinois. So in 1939, the Federation begins. Not five months ago, the second annual convention is held, and today you have your own paper. Um, Beyond that, I'm going to make no more comments on the Beacon Lights. And the Concordia begins in 1944. That's a little more interesting because that, of course, is going to be an occasion for the schism. The Concordia will end up promoting the conditional covenant, the uh, Skildarian covenant view, and the SB will oppose it. But the Concordia did not begin with that in mind. And if you know that the first editor of the Concordia was Garrett Voss, who was staunchly on our side of the issue, then you can appreciate that it begins with a different purpose. And his editorial sets forth what his purpose is. He says, do we really need another magazine? He says, well, for one thing, the church news is gone now. 1943 ends. We're 1944. So it served a function. I'm not sure why it is no longer published, but it serves a function. And let's remember that function and try to carry it on. That's one thing we're going to do. In the second place, 
Many Reformed denominations have more than one publication. And they have more than one publication because one might be more theological and doctrinal. One might be more uh, just church life and church news. Uh, One might address the young people. One might address another segment. So one might address worship and, and liturgy. So there's nothing wrong with having more than one publication. They're not doing the same thing. In the last big paragraph on the bottom of page 14 of the handout, in view of the above, it is really not necessary to prove that Concordia means to complete and not usurp the standard bearer. And then on the top of 15, as to the material, Concordia will not, it cannot be as heavy, massive, and profound as that of the elder sister. And then I'll read the whole Next paragraph. The standard bearer is, purely and simply, a theological periodical. The appeal of Concordia's voice is in a different pitch. Even though we purpose to sing the same melody, in standard bearer, Beacon Lights and Concordia, we see the beginning of a symphony, a harmonious song, a mingling of pleasant sounds. All of which, to underscore the point, as Voss envisioned the Concordia, it was not going to compete or doctrinally oppose the standard bearer, it's going to complement the standard bearer and be a little lighter. It's when Voss later uh, leaves Edgerton and is no longer the editor of the Concordia that things change. And Voss at that point in the 47s becomes an editor of the standard bearer. Remember, Huxma has a stroke in 47. Voss and Veldman step in and take over his place there, and both of them now in the SB uh, take up the pen against Petter and the conditional covenant views that the Concordia is espousing. There are magazines. They proliferate. The first issue of the Beaconites. There are publications, uh, books that are published. Some of them we have yet today, maybe republished, God's Eternal Good Pleasure. That's uh, Huxima's Sermons on Romans 9 through 11. In the Sanctuary, Sermons on the Lord's Prayer, The Mystery of Bethlehem, The Wonder of Grace, Whosoever Will. And then the book, When I Survey, is a compilation or a, a, yeah, a compilation of six smaller books, and five of them are published in 1956, as well as some volumes of the Triple Knowledge, originally appearing in ten volumes. Radio becomes big in the 1940s. The Reformed Witness Hour begins in October of 1941, and it continues to this day. The Sovereign Grace Hour is a radio program, especially uh, sponsored by the Western League of Young People Societies from 1942 to 1950. That's a program that the minister in the RCUS heard and became uh, interested in us. Hope Redlands has yet a third program. It's its own radio program. I don't right now know its name. It comes to Synod saying, could we have some mission funds to help finance and support our radio program? And Synod says, well, we recognize that radio can be a tool for missions, but this is your own congregational endeavor, and the mission funds are given for the denomination, so sorry, no but you may ask other congregations for collections to help your cause. Radio is big. We have uh, the uh, uh, advertisement for the first Reformed Witness Hour uh, broadcast. We have the Sovereign Grace Hour uh, printed um, print of the speech. Let's see, it was given by Reverend uh, Blankespoor. All right, we have conventions that are going on, and I have, I was going to include uh, in your handout, and I didn't, I'll try to do that next week, but South Holland in 1939 first sponsors it in 40 and 44, again in 47, South Holland does again in 45, Oakland in 41, Hudsonville 46, Holland 48, and Pella Oskaloosa in 49, in the years 42 and 43, no convention is held because of the war. So life is very active. Uh, Annual field days, I I was not able yet to find out how long the Grand Rapids area annual field day lasts. 
There is one in the Chicago area in 49. So at some area of the denomination, field days go on. And a big event in 1940 is that the PRC celebrates the 25th anniversary of Reverend Hoeksema's ordination to the ministry. He's ordained in 1915. So uh, the standard bearer has a full issue, a 25th anniversary number in volume 20, well, 25, so it'd be volume 15, I think 16. And, and it's, it's quite an issue. It's, it's worth reading if you can, uh, and if you want to spend time reading some, some history, because it focuses not just on the man, but his work in the denomination, his work in the seminary, etc. Church life is very active in the 40s. Now, a number of ways in which uh, World War II has its effects on the PRC. First of all, men are drafted, or sometimes they enlist rather than being drafted. Especially this is going to have an effect on various congregations. In the Beacon Lights, 1944, uh, late fall of 44, uh, goes a plea out or a request out, send us pictures of men in the service. And in five issues in the late 40s and through the middle 50, uh, 45 rather, late 44 through middle 45, in five issues, I found 195 photographs, and I didn't check to see if any were duplicates, but my sense is they weren't, because the point was to publish uh, every man who was in, in the war. So 195, and let's say that maybe not every man's photograph came to the Beacon Lights. So at least 200 of our men, and how big is the PRC? Uh, 1,300 families. 200, let's round up to 1,400, 200, one, every seventh family on average has one man in the war. That's a significant effect. Um, oops, the wrong way. So there you have the different um, issues and the number of men featured in them. And a couple pictures, just two of those five or six. Uh, to give you an idea, another page is uh, names. Here is the one woman that I found. I don't remember her name. It is not a familiar name in the PRC anymore, but she was from Holland, uh, serving in the medical forces in the war. Another collage of pictures. And yet a third. I think this is the last one, a few leftovers. Uh, so it was probably in June or July of 45. The PRC remembered its men. They produced what was called the Echoes, a, a pamphlet or a, 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 sh a small, very small magazine, to send the men on a regular basis, probably monthly. This was from October 1945. Uh, poems, uh, letters. A book of meditations, actually three different volumes of meditations that are written for men in the service. In addition, the bulletins, this would be a bulletin of First Church, includes the addresses of men in the service and another one from First Church with another uh, group of addresses. Roosevelt Park uh, has on the front page of its bulletin, men in the service of our country, Charles de Young, John de Vries, Fred Katzma, James Offringa, William Offringa, Garrett Van Sulkema, and John Van Sulkema. So these men are remembered, and they're held before the uh, Lord in prayer in the congregational worship services and at many um, a meal. When the war is over, they are, at least First Church now, gives its servicemen a welcome home banquet. And there's a picture of this also in probably one of the memoirs of First Church, I don't remember, somewhere in our archives, and the men are given a banquet. But of course, not all come home. One of my favorite painters is Terry Redland, and 
partly because of his lovely scenery that reminds you of the marshes and the rural areas of Wisconsin and of Minnesota, where I lived for 16 years. But he has a collection of seven paintings called The American Portrait. It's really the story of a little boy. Uh, The little boy gets a dog. So that's number one, his first present. And then the little boy goes off for his first day of school. And there's a picture of him leaving the house. He has his first date, his graduation. Uh, He has his first homecoming. He's at school. Probably this is high school, not college. Uh, And he's off to a boarding school and he comes home. Uh, He has his first goodbye. He's leaving for the army, service in the army. And then the last picture in the collection is his last homecoming. And it isn't him coming home. It's Christmas time. Uh, There's a welcome home banner here. Mom and dad are eagerly awaiting the son's arrival. It's a Navy chaplain saying, your son is killed. Well, that happened in the PRC too. This one isn't a a picture of men killed, but a, a note in the beacon lights of two men wounded, Charles Sykema and Bernard Miedema, One taken prisoner, Charles D. Young of Roosevelt Park. Uh, And then Lawrence Coima missing in action. And if you went to the um, fundraiser for special needs last fall, you know that Lawrence Coima uh, was later also um, declared dead. But here are men who never came home, and their pictures in the beacon lights. Morris Hendrick of 2nd PRC, Southwest. Garrett Viss of Hall PRC. Uh, Bernard Hallstake of Hudsonville. Howard Van Salkema of Roosevelt Park. And John Swart of Fuller Avenue. I am not claiming this is an exhaustive list. I'd like to know more how many of our men went to war and how many did not come back. But if 200 went... We know of five who did not come back alive, uh, six after he had coima. So that happened in the PRC as well. We lost young men in the service of the country. Covenant seed might have been born to them, but that was not the Lord's will for them. And they remind us uh, their sacrifice to their country, but also giving their life that we are to give our life a sacrifice for the better country where they now are. I mentioned the effects on the seminary uh, when I was talking about the seminary. Reduced enrollment, it met in the summer of 44 and 45. It also had to register with government agencies uh, so that the government had, well, I'm going to defer or be declared exempt from military draft because I'm going to some school to be a minister. Um, Is this a school that just started yesterday and it meets in your father's basement? Is this a genuine school? The seminary has to demonstrate itself there. And then after the war is over, it also needs to register with the Veterans Administration because veterans who uh, come back and go to school will receive government support. They can turn in their tuition bill to the government, their book bill to the government. Look in the archives. I'm pretty sure it was... George Lanting, might have been Vandenberg, but I think it was George Lanting, um, has a number of receipts of book bills. He went off to Erdman's and he bought books, and there are the receipts there, and they're in the archives because the TSC had to approve them so that the VA would reimburse him. Uh, The question in missions is, shall we call a camp pastor? Shall we call a missionary to go uh, do missions in the... um, in the army. But the idea really is our men, shall we send one of our men uh, ministers to minister to our men? And the answer is no, that's rather impractical because our men are in Europe and our men are in uh, Okinawa and our men are in the Philippines, our men are all over. But the question is faced. Then there are standard bear articles about the war as to the Christians' participation in war, relief for war-torn Holland, our boys in conscription, 
meaning, uh, of course, not just uh, uh, enlisting, not just the draft, and war and war and our calling. I'm not giving an exhaustive list, but five of them that Hoxima writes, showing that war is very much on the minds of the people. And then a, a sixth, restraint of sin and war babies. And one theme that comes through in this, and another one I'll show in a moment, is that the war just demonstrates that there is no such thing as common grace. It disproves it. Uh, others write, DeWolf writes, modern war and common grace. So another one that proves the point. Um, modern war, not just war disproves it, that's the point DeWolf makes, but modern war, that, that World War II, it was a war like none other. And it just shows that there is no such thing as common grace. Blankaspor writes on the employment of mothers in the war industries. So the SB focuses on it. Beacon Lights, you could read every single issue and you would get something relating to the war. Other effects, rationing, gas for the mission car. All right, there's this mission field called Randolph, Wisconsin. And there isn't a missionary. But if C. Hanko from Oaklawn goes there, and even more, if men from um, uh, Grand Rapids go to Randolph, why don't we buy a car for them? And, the, and they have the car available to use in Randolph. So the mission committee buys a car. Oh, they got a great used car from Van Andel and Flickema. It was a 1940, I think 40, Plymouth. And it was 1943 when they bought it. Well, gas is rationed. But they're able to get approval from one of the government agencies for an extra amount of gas for 600 more miles a month because they're using this car for church work. Uh, what happens is that Randolph is organized then uh, within a year or just over a year. And within 18 months of buying the car, uh, the mission committee sells the car, partly because we don't need it anymore. But besides, it is badly in need of repairs. But it's the mention of uh, the rations. Letters to the president and Congress, I did not put in here. But there are at least two letters that the Senate approves sending to the president. And then after it's all approved, they say, you know, we should send this to every member of Congress as well. The first one is sent in 1941, and it regards the closed shop or labor unions in the defense industries, in the, uh, the, the factories that are producing uh, materials for the war. And it also regards Sabbath labor. Now, to be fighting in a war on Sunday isn't something anyone's going to argue with. The war goes on. But uh, is it possible that the people working in the factories could have Sunday off? That's a concern that gets raised. And then again in 1946, a letter that once again focuses on the closed shop, that is uh, the labor unions in these factories. So the PRC in that way too uh, gets involved. It shows that the war is part of their life. And that leads me next to, you know what I forgot to do? I forgot to ask for questions at appropriate points. It leads me to the third section, Harbingers of War, now the spiritual war. And because it's quarter to nine, I stop at this point. I will pick up here next time. And uh, you have opportunity to ask questions right now. Sorry, I forgot all about my students. Teachers should never do that. But I did. Any questions you have on tonight? I could give you the mic, but I will do my best instead to repeat the question into my microphone. All right. Uh, some of you have not always questions, but given me comments. Uh, added little tidbits. I do appreciate that. Any extra info you have, I either need to remember and write down immediately, which I'm not ready to do, or if you would email me, I can remember it much better, and I certainly appreciate that. Next week will be the last week. We'll finish the 40s by not only looking at uh, the harbingers of 1953, but some issues that I said the classes faced uh, and with that, bring the season to an end. I thank you again for coming out tonight and your continued interest. I think I saw that my first...
video is almost up to 1,600 views, and the others lag behind, but I think people generally start with number one. So uh, that's encouraging too. Let us close. Our Father which art in heaven, Let us control history. And on the one hand, there are times when we don't see war. And that's true of us. Right now, there are wars going on in the world, but as churches, we're not engaged or affected significantly by any of those earthly battles. And other times when we must see and learn war. And that regards earthly battles too, as it was during World War II. But even more, there are times when it seems that the church maybe is not engaged or doesn't see spiritual war. Then we have to ask if we've forgotten our calling and if we've forgotten the danger, spiritual dangers in which we always are, and forgotten the ever-present and vigilant attacks of the enemy. So give us to know war, to learn war, to be ready to do war spiritually with Satan and with the wicked world and with our own sinful nature. And if we've forgotten to do war with our own sinful nature, and especially, Father, teach us to war. We know there comes another war on earth, the war of Christ against Antichrist. And before Christ appears, it will appear that Antichrist will have the victory and will win. And that men and women and nations will follow him. And so cause us always to remember that our Lord comes and he will finally have the victory. Give us to live in the hope of that day and the desire that that day comes soon so that our prayer now is even so come, Lord Jesus. Bless the events of the evening again. Forgive graciously our sins, anything said or done in sin. Give us safety in our journey home and hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen.